well, we're going to see more phosphorus, phosphate, and we'll see um, some microbes, I suppose. I'm going to talk today about um, the um, microbial mats and, and uh, microbes in the, uh, from the geobank formation, which is part of the Torridonian uh, sequence in northwestern Scotland. Here's our 2008 field recovery. We had nine days of no rain. <laughs> <laughs> and we get, you get a lot of work done when it's not raining up there. Uh, this is a, a diagram uh, from the paper showing some of the outcrops I'm talking about today. Um, I think the geology of this section is pretty well known uh, for those uh, in the UK. The Torridonian sequence uh, consists of three blocks that are who's the, 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 of, of three units uh, whose relation is not terribly well known. Together, the, the star group, uh, the slate group, and, or slate group, and then the, the uh, Torridonian. And to, I'm talking today about the uh, geobag formation, which is a lacustrine shale that occurs at the base of uh, the Torridonian. So these this, these lakes uh, rest directly on uh, the Louisian uh, nice terrain. Uh, and our interest in this, this is a work that I've done with uh, Charles Wellman at, at in, uh, at Sheffield is primarily uh, as palynologist. In other words, we're looking at the recovery of, uh, of, uh, uh, of organic matter from acid maceration. And so, hence, we, the sampling gray shales. Age of around 1,000 million. Here's the uh, type locality for the geobag uh, at lower uh, geobag, and these shales here are where the, a lot of these uh, sediments come from. Um, the uh, microbial mats, the MISS, is fairly well known. Uh, there's a, a, a pretty good uh, history of um, description of these things. I think the best paper uh, right now I know of is the, uh, this paper here in terms of describing the, the patterns and the, and the uh, microbial mat structures. Here's from the uh, Stewart's monograph showing the section. We have about 100 meters of shale. And then once the sandstone comes in, uh, the, the stratigraphy is, by definition, moves into the apple cross formation. Um, let's see, in 2011, we described a lot of the, of the panological component, but there also are phosphate nodules that occur uh, mixed in with these beds. So just a few pretty pictures. Uh, there's, there are more in Neil's poster, <laughs> probably more than you'll see here. Uh, just the textures on the surfaces of these things. I don't know what these are sedimentary markings, and then there's a lot of uh, reticulate uh, MISS. Uh, if you look at the uh, opposite surface, you get this so-called elephant skin texture that occur here. Here's another example. This one is from the Kinloch Formation on the Isle of Skye, which has a lot of features that are very similar to the Chiabeg. This is an Obgoskaveg. Uh, other sort of reticulate MISS features that you see here. And this guy, you begin to see some examples in the, the reticulate surfaces that actually retain these kind of circular impressions as well. And that'll become significant as we move on. Uh, reticulated surfaces covering ripple marks as well. So occurring within, uh, you know, water, you know, uh, uh, you know, sedimentary, uh, sedimentology, I mean, sedimentary uh, sediments that have water flow over them within the lake. Uh, desiccation cracks are quite common. Uh, that the, at the type section, I, don't, I think uh, Stuart mentioned something like over 200 uh, layers where you can see uh, well-developed uh, mud cracks, desiccation cracks. Um, and this is from the Wellman paper. I don't know if it shows up too well on the screen, but here's a uh, a desiccation crack that's coarsely infilled. And in this section, you, or this slide, you can see that the reticulate mat has actually covered over the surface. That is the first layer of shale that's come back in. The uh, finer grain sediment actually covers over the, uh, what was clearly a desiccated surface. So you're looking at a sequence that's extremely shallow and includes subaerial exposure. Um, and this is, uh, those cracks can be uh, coarsely infilled. Uh, as well, and then here's a, a slide from um, Chris Baldwin. 
showing that this coarse material then comes in and, and fills in the cracks. And his comment is about that this is, it, it appears that may, perhaps the surfaces, the finer grain surfaces, are actually partially bound by microbial mats, and that allows the coarser grains to bypass that surface and, and be deposited. Um, so in terms of interpreting uh, the reticulate mat surfaces, the classic way of looking at that, I think, is to look at this as the, uh, you know, correctly looking on the upper part of the surface. This, when you first look at that, it reminds, at least reminds me very much of, this is Lingvia mat from uh, Shark Bay in West Australia. Uh, Lingvia then being a filamentous cyanobacterium that can glide and typically forms uh, tufted mats or, or reticulate type of mats when the, the, when the filaments come together. So here's just an example at approximately the same scale. And I think that so the, the you know, you're at first, you know, the first interpretation is, oh, well, this is a cyanobacterial mat, a filamentous mat. Um, but interpreting that uh, reticulate mat has been, is a little bit tricky. Here's an example from the upper Chiabeg uh, outcrop where the same thing occurs in red beds, so we're not going to see any organic matter or recovery of fossils from that. And then going back to the original description of the sequence uh, of the whole unit from 1907, 1908, um, it has been proposed that these, there are raindrop impressions in some of these surfaces. And you can find surfaces that have some elements of the reticulate texture, but also have clear elements of, of circular structure as well. Um, here's an example um, within the uh, red bed sequence of where, uh, what are interpreted as raindrop impressions. And sometimes you actually find, I don't forget what it's called, but you get the little drop in the middle of the, you know, from the impact of the rain or sleet coming down. So basically what happens is you can find a whole range of this sort of reticulate structure that grades into uh, features that have been interpreted as, as raindrop impressions, and actually for quite a, a long time that way. So there's sort of two little stories here. One is this model of, well, is it, you know, what's the model that we come up with uh, in terms of how do you produce this kind of texture? Um, uh, this is the section at uh, Batacro, and it's extremely slippery, fall down. Uh, it's this, the, the shales here in outcrop are covered by just slimy algae. I don't know the composition of the algae, but here, you know, it rains in Scotland. It's a pound coin. So you've got these circular impressions that come. I don't remember whether it was rain or sleet. I think I might have been sleeting that day, but anyway. So uh, just this idea, oh, here's a dried version of that same thing. And in fact, you can move along the section, that, that same surface, and go into the actual wet mass. And so you actually re retain this sort of shape of the organic so that then moved aside from the raindrop impression. So here was this idea that maybe we have a lot of uh, EPS on the surface, fine grade surface. Uh, these are very immature fabrics with angular silt grains in there, so they can kind of lock together, and once they're in position, they can lock and retain that reticulate shape uh, from rain or sleet. So maybe that's true, maybe it's not. So uh, in terms of the paleo environment, we have a series of freshwater lakes. It's pretty wet, must have rained at some point, and that these are mats that persist in very shallow water uh, environments. So here's the overlying uh, apple cross end my co-author Charles Wellman, looking very happy. So here's a second little story. It's a story of just looking at some of the phosphate nodules. And in this case, we get three-dimensional preservation of, of microorganisms. So here's our outcrop. There's the little chunk that we've uh, excavated. And you can see the phosphate nodules as these nodular uh, uh, secretions that occur within the bedding planes. Here's a slice through one of them, it's an organic rich layer. And you see this, uh, the angularity of these uh, sediments. You don't see a lot of uh, biology in the transfer sections. Sometimes you get a polynomorph occasionally uh, trapped in there. But instead, we look at bedding plane sections. Uh, so here's a, a bedding plane section through a phosphate nodule. And this contorted bed is just because it's shallow and it's not particularly flat, so a shallow angle. Taking a look at some of these. So here's an example to try to show you 
that when you look at the content, the organic content the, of the organisms, the microorganisms that are in there, particularly with regard to the filamentous sheaths, this is not like a stromatolite where you have oriented filaments. Instead, it's an these are alachmanists. The organic component has been washed in to this particular sediment and then trapped in the, in three-dimensionally in the phosphate. I try to show this by just measuring the angles and the orientation of the, of the sheaths within a, uh, <coughs> within a, a, a single thin section, 10 microns. Typically, the, the 10 microns are the size. But also, and very rarely, occasional, a couple of the sections that we look at um, are filled with this elongate ellipsoidal uh, microfossil, which we described as probably cyanobacteria, eohalothiki, eohalothiki uh, in a paper in, micro, in uh, paleontology last year. And these occur um, distributed just within a sort of an organic rich matrix. Uh, so here are the microfossils. They're about five to seven microns uh, in length. And they just, I, you don't see evidence of like cell division or you know, growth patterns or anything like that. They just appear in some cases to just to be kind of distributed throughout the, the, you know, the EPS with, within a particular layer. Uh, we came up with a, a highly speculative model <laughs> uh, relating, uh, relating to the, the retention of phosphate. Um, it's, it, the idea, this is actually from uh, the Nunsuch Shale, which is a, a, a billion-year-old lake in uh, northern Michigan. And it, it, the, the, uh, this Eohalothiki is much more abundant uh, in that that deposit, that age equivalent deposit, but it occurs uh, in, in, uh, as a planktonic member, in addition to seeing that the cell, same cells preserved in an benthic environment. And this form, uh, this clathrate form, is typical of, of, well, it's not typical, but it's characteristic of uh, cyanobacterial. Uh, blooming cyanobacterial. Uh, microcystis is a good example of that. Microcystis is notorious for producing uh, this non-ribosomal ribosomal amino acid uh, uh, called microcystin or microcystins. It's a family of uh, phosphatase inhibitors, and these are extruded externally by cyanobacteria, and they're known to, in Brazil to kill dogs and that sort of thing. So there's, a, there's actually a large uh, uh, medical-oriented literature on microsystems and the, the nature of, the, of this poison. So our model is the idea that these were uh, producing excess microsystems. Uh, here's some work from David Wasey showing the francolite, that is the uh, uh, phosphate, preserved inside a cell wall along with clay mineralization. Uh, and so that we actually have in situ formation of, of calcium phosphate. So that there has to be some way of trapping and preventing the inorganic phosphate from being resorbed back into the, bio, into the biological world. Uh, this is a bit far-fetched, but it turns out there are, are a couple of other papers in the literature that, that claim, that have used this idea that, that uh, microcystins uh, are, are as, as generated by cyanobacteria are related to uh, phosphorus and phosphatic events, and including the possibility in muscle, for example, that that was the reason for the uh, great preservation there. Uh, summary then, very quickly, reticulumis was probably not formed by cyanobacteria, but is really an example in this case of MIS, I mean, an example of uh, EPS type of, uh, uh, of, of biomat or biofilm that was sitting on top or growing within uh, what were clearly our allochthonous components of both organic and sedimentary allochthonous components coming into the bottom of this lake. Uh, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Any comments, questions? No? Oh, 
Too big as, as late? Yeah. Uh, I think the best, I mean, it's a sedimentological story that's gone on for, I don't know, 100 years. Neil knows more about it than I do. Uh, but there's also the, I, I think the boron <coughs> story kind of indicates that it has to be non marine. There's some concerns. You don't think the teleology kind of fed on that story? No, I mean, they sort of kind of use the, the, use the sedimentology to define the paleo story. Okay. You know, that this is basically a non marine. I don't know about the microsystems versus, you know, freshwater versus marine, but the, uh, most of the studies of, of the cyanobacterial, you know, bioclouds are the, the, mostly not. Okay. Okay. Thank you.